today was just a quick welcome and then very, very quickly so that we all know who each other are. We're going to go through the room and very loudly please say your name, whether you're with Natural Cultural or you're a CPLO, CPLO or what your affiliation is and um, what installation you work at or where you work at so we can kind of figure out who's in the room. So I'll quickly get started. My name is Tammy Conkle. I work at Commander Navy Installations Command, and I am the Natural and Cultural Resources Program Manager. <laughs> All right. I'll go right up here next. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Commander Jim Roach. I am the uh, CNIC um, Encroachment Action Officer. I work somewhat with Tammy and a lot with a number of other folks uh, related to environmental and installations. Uh, I'm Bill Manley, NAFAC Headquarters Cultural Resources. I work in D.C. Go ahead, Gail. I'm Gail Field. I work with Bill Manley at the uh, NAFAC Headquarters Cultural Resources Office. We're located at the Washington Navy Yard in a wonderful, uh, sustainable, and affordable place. That's us. That's you, Everett. That's me. Hi, I'm Everett Smith. Um, I used to work with Bill, but now he left. I'm a historian with NAFAC Southwest, San Diego and I work in an ugly old building. Okay, we're just trying to do names. <laughs> Steve Andrews, I'm the Natural Resources Manager at Naval Support Activity Crane. Jim Copeland, C-12, Advanced Meridian, Mississippi. David Sullivan, FX Hawaii, I support the region full time as their deputy regional environment coordinator. I'm Hillary Shanker, uh, NAFAC headquarters. Jim Cassidy, NAFAC Southwest San Diego, Cultural Resource Manager. Andy Osco, NAFAC Southwest San Diego. Gary Bushwalk, Cultural Resource Manager, NAS Pensacola. John Smith, San Jose, with Allison, I do a lot of environmental work for 845. Commander Ryan George, OpNet, and 46 Resource Boxes. So, for the cultural people in the room that don't know, that's the money man right there. <laughs> Hugs and kisses are welcome. No, I'm just kidding. Conrad Griffiths, I'm with Mantech International. I do fleet support. John Berger, I work for the commander of the Pacific Fleet for the Range Environmental uh, Sustainment Support Contract as an environmental coordinator on the Pacific Missile Range and Sustainment Support. I'm Barbara Howell. I'm Navy Region Southeast and NAMPAC Southeast. Go, Roger. And I'm giving out a woohoo for him because I was born at Millington. Woohoo! So.
And Michelle? Rob? Dan? Daryl? Jeff? Introduce yourself, please, sir. And the gentleman sitting next to you, I'm sorry. Yeah, you might not find it very interesting, but you can certainly listen. <laughs> um, one of the things we wanted to do by this session today was make sure that we all knew each other, so that I found that very helpful. Um, I think one of the things that will really help the Navy is if we start integrating more our natural, cultural, and encroachment sides of the house. So um, Kelly Brock wasn't able to attend today because um, she hurt her back. Um, and so she sends her regrets, and she's sorry that she couldn't be here. But she did send out a call for questions for the group, for the natural resources side of the house, and we did get responses. And one of the things that was um, readily apparent by the responses was that there, there's a lot of questions about who works for who. <laughs> um, I, I will tell you that I'm not going to get into roles and responsibilities. Um, if you have questions about roles and responsibilities, especially between CNIC and NAVFAC, I suggest you talk to your chain of command or read the con ops. And if you have any questions, then we can address it after that. But I mean, that is a complicated issue, and we could spend an hour and a half just talking about that. So that said, um, we're going to talk about Navy organization a little bit. And um, I, I'm going to disclaim this information by saying that um, the Navy is constantly reorganizing. And the information that I have here was pulled off the web, and it was dated 2006 and 2007. Conceptually, though, I think it's accurate, and I think it explains the major question about the difference between CNIC and NAFAC. Um, so everybody knows the Secretary of the Navy um, and who the Secretary of the Navy is and what their purpose is, but I wanted to just make sure that everybody's aware, in case they aren't, that the, the Department of the Navy, which falls under the Secretariat, um, does um, encompass both the United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps. We are just the United States Navy here in the room today, unless somebody from the Marine Corps decided to join us, which I didn't hear. Um, so that said, we're one half of the Secretariat's office. Most of the folks that you, were, you will hear about from the Secretariat's office um, are Mr. Don Shrigardis. He's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Environment. Um, and um, Mr. Tom Eglin, Mr. John Pearson, they both support Mr. Shrigardis. Um, and for the purposes of the cultural resources conversation, Mr. Shugardis is our federal preservation officer, so our designated. And so that's, Bill will talk about that a little bit later. So if you go on to the website um, for the Navy, um, it kind of shows you this wonderful org chart that shows you how the Secretary of the Navy has different support functions. And you'll see at the very bottom there, I don't know if this will work. I usually talk with my hands, so this is kind of weird. And here's the Chief of Naval Operations and the Commandant of the Marine Corps. So now we're going to focus on this part of the Secretary of the Navy, just Chief of Naval Operations. Actually, I should point out that Mr. Shugardis works in this office, which is now called uh, in, in Installations Energy and Environment. Is that right? It's got an extra E in there now. So, so then we get to the Chief of Naval Operations. and. Um, He's the, the four-star admiral that's responsible for all the Navy, supports the secretary. And when you get to the CNO staff, we're talking about just the CNO staff, these are the people that work under the CNO. And this is where you, for the folks that are new, can start understanding some of these N codes and how they relate to definitions. So N1 is manpower, personnel, education, and training. N2 is information, which is kind of combined with N6. But N4 is fleet readiness and logistics. N8 is integration of capabilities and resources. The key word there being resources. These are the money people. And then N3 and 5, and this is reorganized um, operations, plans, and strategies. And if um, you are more than welcome, Commander George, to correct me at any moment, because they have reorganized a lot since this material. This, I just wanted to get, I know you can, nobody can read this, but. Um, the purpose of this slide is to show you that this is the staff of CNO. And so, you know, 
people will say, oh, I work at CNO and 45, I work at CNIC and 45. The people that are shown on all this eye chart are the, are the individuals and the commanders and the admirals that support um, the Chief of Naval Operations directly. So they're on his direct chain of line staff. And so I can't even read it myself, but somewhere in here, this general area, <laughs> is N4, and underneath N4, we have two program sponsors for natural and cultural resources. We have CNO N45, and we have CNO N46. And so CNO 46 is represented by Commander George. Um, and Kelly, if she was here, she would be representing CNO N45. Um, Commander Landis back there, he also supports CNO N45. So um, that's, that's the separation there. And unfortunately, I have no idea where your funding comes from, Commander. So somewhere Everybody. in CNO N4. <laughs> So then underneath the CNO, there, he has um, what they call the operating forces. And I, I think this is very odd because of the terminology. But CNIC, which is Naval Installations, falls under what they call operating forces um, under CNO. Because I, I believe, the way that I understand it, it's because the stand-up of Navy Installations was essentially that's the shore fleet. You know, you know, you have the operating fleet and then you have the shore, the shore support for the fleet. And so it's our Admiral, um, Admiral Vitale, he, he's, he sits there on that side. So CNIC supports the fleet fighter and family and, and our mission is to deliver effective and efficient readiness from the shore. And the vision is to be the sole provider of shore capability to support and sustain the fleet, enable the fighter and support the family. So if you look at CNIC, it's organized into regions, and most of you know that because you're from the regions, um, and then it's, each region has installations underneath it. This is our current org chart for the regional commanders, um, and then the primary staffs within um, Admiral Vitale's chain of command, and, and Admiral, Commander Roach and Cheryl and I support Captain Campbell in N4, and I'm in CNIC N45, uh, as is Cheryl, and Commander Roach is in CNIC N4-4. Four. Four. So. so then you have the shore establishment, which by definition you think would be CNIC, but it's not CNIC. <laughs> um, this is where you have the Bureau of Naval Personnel, Bureau of Medicine and Surgery, and um, NAVFAC is right here. So that if you get to NAVFAC, you know, most of you support NAVFAC, but essentially NAVFAC is the systems command that delivers and maintains quality and sustainable facilities, acquires and manages capabilities for the Navy's expeditionary combat forces, provides contingency engineering response, and enables energy, energy security and environmental stewardship. Um, the real alignment of CNIC assets at the regional level to work under NAVFAC happened a while ago, so the environmental part of that piece now includes the CNIC-funded staff. And so, oops, so that's essentially the overview part of the, the, um, the brief. And I, I appreciate that it was fast and furious, but hopefully you now kind of have context in which to put the people that you know within the Navy. So in, for the purposes of our chain of command at CNIC, we report to Admiral Vitale, and then the NAVFAC side of the house reports to Admiral Mossy. And um, they are, we all sit in the same building, <laughs> but um, we, we do work for different admirals. So. With that, I will turn it over to Bill Manley, and he can give you an overview of the Culture Resources Program, unless there's any questions. Does anybody have any questions? Hmm? Do I look like a computer person? I have no idea. Where is it, Bill? Okay, hi everybody. Um, I, just to get help me get oriented to the to because I'm going to be talking about cultural resources. I know not everyone here deals with cultural resources. Can you give me a show of hands? How many folks here deal with cultural resources directly? Wow. Okay, cool. That's so most of the group. Um, sorry, sorry to the folks who aren't doing cultural resources. I'll try not to. I'll try to talk to you too. Um, Next question, how many folks here were uh, were able to come to our Navy uh, all day session on Sunday? We really had a great turnout, and I, I want to thank you all for, for making that sacrifice to come. Now, here's the hard question, and I want you to really be honest. 
How many of you folks who came on Sunday feel it was worthwhile? Great. Me too. I, I think it was great. The Navy session. We, we also had a separate Navy session, so I thought ours was worthwhile too. Oh, well, I'm talking only cultural now. That's crazy. Oh, really? I, I, I guess I don't know where you work, so I can't answer how that happened. But uh, okay, so Tammy talked about the the Navy organization in a in a broad conceptual way. I'm going to do a similar thing briefly about the Navy Cultural Resources organizational structure, similarly with disclaimers and you know deniability all over it. But but the point here is just to show you. Uh, in general terms, a couple of basic things. Obviously, a lot of folks are down here, <laughs> but I wanted you to see what the organization in general terms looks like above you or around or wherever you are, or what, essentially. And crucially, these yellow labels indicate uh, a role or a responsibility that's linked with uh, the regulatory requirements, particularly the National Historic Preservation Act. So we have SECNAV as the head of the agency. We have, this, this is in brackets, the senior policy official. This is a, a position that's identified in Preserve America has never really been formally designated, but there's some talk that, that we may at some point, but certainly if we did, it would be uh, uh, the ASN. Uh, we have the Dassin, who is the federal preservation officer, Mr. Zagardis that Tammy mentioned. Uh, then DFPO, which is my office, uh, NAFAC headquarters, uh, and then these, Obviously, the agency official would be the, the undertaking uh, responsible official in, in pretty much all cases. Uh, and then here are the managers, and the, the, the typically the qualified support would come, well, not necessarily echelon three. This, this is very simplified. It could be a regional office as well, but you get the idea. Uh, now, and then the other side of this, of this is, the, is the program sponsorship, which Tammy made reference to, which is under CNO, uh, is, is N46, which is the program sponsor for cultural resources, and, and CNIC, which is the program <coughs> manager, and as you know, manages the, the POM process and execution. So just real quick, I'm going to interrupt Bill, which is rude, but just so everybody understands, program sponsor means that they're the entity within the organization that asks for money and tells what your program requirements are up the chain of command, and they defend what your requirements are so that they can try and get you funding. Um, and then I think the other thing that's important to call out from this org chart is the concept of echelon, echelon one, two, and three, because that seems a little confusing. And I'll tell you why it is confusing, and that's why this is a good chart. It's because once you go down the NAFAC chain, there's an added echelon. And um, if you go down the CNIC chain, um, so the numbers change at the bottom. So um, if, you talk, can I borrow your phone? if you're talking about CNO and echelon one, sometimes People call SECNAV Echelon 1, but in the terms of what we're discussing right now, CNO would be Echelon 1, CNIC and NAFAC headquarters would be Echelon 2, the regional commanders would be Echelon 3, and the installation commanding officers would be Echelon 4. If you go down the NAFAC side, Echelon 2, then you jump down to Echelon 3, Latin Pack, and then when you get back to the installation, you're at Echelon 4. Well, no, then you get to the region, which is echelon four, and then I don't think there really is an echelon five, but it, if there is, then that becomes insulation. So the regional commanders in the NAFAC chain, well, that's really the NAFAC N4, are, um, are, re are one less echelon technically on the NAFAC side than they are on the CNIC side. So sometimes, and we're, we're not going to talk about this, but I just want to say this as a disclaimer. Sometimes we send taskers out, Navy taskers, and they go through the CNIC chain, and that's because CNIC can't really technically direct all the way down to an echelon three. It's, it's a very, you have to understand that that's a jump to go over there. So we had that discussion on Sunday about why when we send out taskers from CNIC, they don't come through land and pack, and that's because NAFAC is not in our chain of command that way. So because when we send out, they come through the, CNIC to the regional commanders to the installation commanding officers. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So what I want to talk about in relation to the organization is, and this, these are kind of lumped together for for expedience purposes here. Uh, 
But I want to talk about three aspects of organizational change within the cultural resources community. The first one, uh, and I'm looking at a two-year span, essentially arbitrarily defined since the last SMR conference. Uh, in two years' time, the cultural resources program overall, Navy-wide, has gained more than two dozen qualified professionals. Uh, that is real growth in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the competency that we have in this organization. Uh, uh, what I'm calling alignment here is essentially um, a better recognition, clearer, I mean, it's, it's a process clearly that, that has a long way to go, but in the last couple of years, we've definitely seen uh, improved understanding of the relationships and the roles. So for example, that org chart that we just flashed up there and talked about for a while, uh, that's a relatively new artifact where we, could, where we could put in one place, how do these issues come together? It's still very complicated, but we're getting closer to understanding uh, how we work the, this essentially matrix organization that supports a, 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 a chain of command hierarchy. Uh, and, and I was just mentioned here that, that uh, there's uh, the, 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 the new cultural resources chapter, significant revision of, of uh, the, the cultural resources chapter in, in the OPNAV 5090 goes a long way toward codifying and, and clarifying for everyone how we work together, how we manage cultural resources responsibilities. Then the last one uh, I will add here is what I'm calling recognition, which is that uh, with, with, with a as we're, as alignment is getting clearer, as the program is growing, as we've got a lot of great people, uh, and I, I really wish I had time to acknowledge all the new great people in cultural resources in the room, but it would take too long, I'm afraid. I'll just tell you that I really, I'm really thrilled at the people we have, that this, uh, that this growth has resulted in part in a better recognition of what the cultural resources program does for the Navy. Uh, we're more visible. We have Commander George here uh, from OPNAV N46. Uh, we, we're well connected to CNIC now at, at the ASN level, at the DASN level. Uh, cultural Resources is much more visible and engaged in how the Navy works than ever before. And that is very significant uh, progress, I think. And I think that's something that's going to that bodes well for us in the future. Okay, data. Uh, this is a this is a um, a summary chart. This is is this a CNIC chart? This is a, an adaptation of a CNIC yeah. chart. You you can see here, and we could spend a long time talking about this, but the but it's a summary uh, of what the Navy is is about as it comes to as it as comes from culture in, from the perspective of cultural resources, and critically, this this data section here. Uh, this is what comes out of our, the last uh, uh, version of the DEPARC. Um, and that's occasion for some discussion. We, uh, we know that, that some of the DEPARC data, some of the questions that, that we answer when we do DEPARC data calls don't particularly make sense in Navy terms. Uh, we know that some of the answers that we've gotten when we ask those questions are a little confused. The answers have been a little confused. Uh, and we know that the processes of digesting that data into charts like this and into the DEPARC itself, the report that goes to Congress, has introduced more confusion. Uh, <laughs> so there are issues here and it's important because cultural resources really is data in, in a lot of ways and so it's, we're working hard uh, at headquarters level uh, and we're going to be asking for more support from, from the community to improve the quality of what we, can, what we know and can report about, about what the program uh, 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 manages. So I'm, I'm calling this slide Data Trends. Um, and here, and, and for purposes again of expediency, I have included cultural resources program requirements, costs, and the direct link to mission support as critical data points related to our program. I mean, I could do a whole slide on funding and mission support, but for purposes of this brief, I just want to say that this is critical data that we report through our, through the POM process and through our, through our responses to data calls that helps our organization understand what cultural resources is all about. You know, if, if anything we've heard through this week at various points uh, from Sunday until today, uh, is that cultural resources need, is, is sometimes left out of the discussion until too late, sometimes not understood at all or misunderstood uh, critically until it's too late. 
um, and the need to be engaged early. I believe this is, this is a number one requirement in terms of early engagement with cultural resources, so that the POM process you've all just been uh, through and, and the work that will continue uh, to demonstrate how the program supports the mission, uh, this is this crucial data that we, uh, that we manage. Uh, we will, you'll hear more about, I think Tammy's got some, some uh, live connection that we'll use in a little bit, about a new cultural resource, natural cultural resources data center uh, that is being developed, um, uh, connected with EMS web that is, has much greater functionality than, we, than we've ever seen in terms of our data management capability. Uh, and it will, it, the, the intent, and we're really, we've really gone a long way to, to, toward this goal already, is that it will serve not only as a data collection uh, a, a resource, but it will also be a management tool that the installation and regional managers will have the ability to, to, to use, we hope, on a regular basis. The goal of this is that it will be entirely functional uh, uh, as, a, as a data management for you. Uh, I just want to note that the, that the, the, data, the built environment data call that we ran last year uh, generated a lot of very valuable data that will support us well as we go before uh, the Department of Defense for the uh, environmental management review uh, later in the year. Uh, uh, and th the, the data there is, has still great utility. And we will, we're not going to run that data call this next year, uh, but we will definitely want to do it again in the future after we've had more chance to digest it. Because again, it's critical to explain, especially in the, the built environment that, that we deal with so much, it's very important that uh, installation planners and, and various decision makers understand where we are and where our challenges are. Uh, I mentioned DEPARC data review. Uh, we are working, uh, headquarters folks are working, CNIC and NAFAC headquarters folks are working with DOD and our service compatriots to, to revise the questions. I'll put it that way in general terms. We're looking at the questions, trying to make the case to uh, the Federal Preservation Officer of the Department of Defense that we need to clarify the questions and bring them a little more into focus so that they actually correspond to the DOD uh, culture resources metrics. Uh, and the goal there is to get better data and to make it more efficient and less of a burden to generate that data. There's a lot of processing that goes on now that seems not to help. Uh, we'd like to avoid that. Then the last one is just kind of kudos to everyone who uh, uh, participates in the Executive Order 13175 uh, 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 report that we just generated. Uh, we're already getting uh, a lot of appreciation from DOD for, again, doing a great job of responding to that data call. That's, that's a very important, uh, and it'll continue, that, that will grow uh, as we, as we uh, um, see changes in the, the DOD instruction for uh, tribal coordination. We expect that change to occur, I think, I'm not sure by the end of the fiscal year, but before very long, the instruction will be modified to incorporate NHO coordination and consultation uh, just the same as, as uh, uh, other tribal consultation. Okay, uh, so with all we've heard all week, you know, the, uh, uh, and, and very much here as well, the, the issue is that we, we're always communicating with, with uh, our chain of command, among ourselves, uh, with our outside stakeholders about what cultural resources is all about, wherever we're, whatever the area is that we're managing. Uh, and, what we've been, we've worked hard in the past year, and you'll soon see, in fact, I think you can now see, uh, if the link works, in the email that we sent out last week, uh, you can see, oh, oh, wait a minute, violin lesson, hold on. Sorry. Emma will be my daughter, and she has violin like right now. <laughs> my husband is taking her, I won't be. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I just want to give a, a, a brief overview. Many of you may already be very familiar with the, with the program metric. Um, I am very enthusiastic about this. I believe that this is going to be, uh, while it'll be tough at first, there are a lot of challenges inherent in this kind of, in this kind of a metric a goal because of the fact that, that uh, we're, we will be asking for input and participation from a, a, a very broad set of uh, stakeholders, I guess you could call them, uh, internal stakeholders and external stakeholders and the chain of command. 
uh, to engage with us in, in, in giving us feedback from various, it's not quite a 360, 360 degree review, but it's a little bit like that in terms of, uh, you know, asking for how well are we doing, uh, uh, we, we, we'll generate those values from multiple perspectives. And so the primary goal of this is to, is to gather information to show how well we're doing over time. It's not intended, especially not the first time out of the, out of the shoot, which will we, hope, we hope will be this fall, to be um, kind of a grading exercise to, to uh, ding people on, on good or bad, you know, especially the bad scores. The, the intent is to generate a baseline of what's really going on. Because we certainly know that, 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 we're not, that not everything is running great. The point is to get real information uh, about how we're doing from different perspectives so that we can then move forward. Uh, and this definitely will be an annual data call. This will be a tasker that gets, that gets sent down from CNIC. So it'll happen. This is being, we were tasked to, de to develop this by, uh, by the CNIC Admiral. Mr. Shigardis uh, at FPO is also very strong on this as uh, information that he wants to see that's comparable, not the same, but sort of comparable to uh, the, the uh, uh, natural resources metrics that he looks forward to seeing now. So just quickly, the program metric which we developed last year and we've been sort of beta testing and, and modifying over the past year uh, looks at nine aspects of what a cultural resources program is. I won't read them all. They're sort of self-explanatory, I think, for the most part. There's lots to say about all of them, uh, and you can see lots of information about them on the website. Crucial information here is that the, not all of these questions are, and are not all of these, these are, uh, these are focus areas. And then within these nine focus areas, there are criteria, uh, 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 essentially questions or, or measures to, that, that, ye, that then yield a, uh, an index for a specific focus area. Not all the focus areas and certainly not all the questions are asked of everyone. So internal stakeholders, depending on what your relationship is to this, will get a subset. Obviously, the CR managers, uh, collectively defined, will have access to them all. Uh, but other internal stakeholders will, will get a subset. We're not going to ask, you know, planners to tell us uh, how complete our surveys are. Uh, and similarly, on the, on the external stakeholder side, there will be a subset of questions that's focused on the kinds of, uh, I'll call them indices of, 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 of uh, performance that they have a direct relationship to. This is not intended, I know there's a lot of sensitivity about the idea that we will be giving shippos and tippos or affected tribes or uh, you know the blue-haired ladies of, of the warehouse district some special power over us. Uh, that is not, I don't believe that's going to happen. This is a communication tool that, and you know if you look at NHPA there's no question that we have a responsibility to communicate and this is, we think this is going to be a way to bring that into, into focus. So you'll be seeing that soon and we're going to, we know there will be lots to talk about. Major program goals for cultural resources in the next year. Field the program metric. Uh, 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 focus the, our funding efforts on, and, and, our, and our execution efforts on communicating success in supporting the mission. I think I've got a phrasing problem there on that bullet, but the point is to, uh, to communicate how, even at the smallest level, I think it's going to be important to recognize that when the program runs well and we support day-to-day -day requirements, that's mission support. We, we want to gather that. I think the metric will help us with this, but always through the process. We want to be able to communicate that when the program runs well, it supports the mission. Uh, curation compliance has gotten a lot of attention lately, uh, and so we'll be talking more about that. We're on task actually to pr present a brief to Mr. Shigardis uh, pretty soon about what we're doing with curation to improve our, uh, our performance because he was, uh, lots of folks are concerned about how low the number is that we're, we, we reached the, the, uh, the great height of 12.9 percent we report of being in compliance with our collections. So we're going to be working on that soon. Uh, we're working to improve culture resource, improve and expand culture resources training to make it more broadly available and more up to date and responsive. Uh, uh, the, the management database, I've already talked a lot about that. And execution efficiencies is a big topic. Uh, we talked a lot about this on Sunday. 
Uh, I'm not going to go through all of it now, but it's essentially looking for ways to uh, expand our, our in-house capabilities uh, because we can be much more responsive and efficient when we're working in-house in many situations that run through a contract, looking for ways to expand the use of cooperative agreements and CSUs. Yes, CSUs. You can tell how much I know about CSUs. Uh, but these are, these are opportunities we have to uh, increase our efficiency. Uh, and that's all for me. Well, I think we're taking questions at the end, so we'll, we'll go to the next one. So actually one of the things that I wanted to talk about real quickly was that um, I had the privilege of teaching the past two senior shore leadership classes um, to the new coming commanding officers and I wanted to share with you the information that we're putting out to the commanding officers and I'm sorry I thought I copied it over but I didn't. Um, I have to think about where I'm going, wait a second. <clears throat> My brain's not working anymore. Can you help finding something? I just need to see like the computer guy set up my computer and I don't do it this way at home, so it causes me problems. Crap. Sorry, just give me a minute. Everybody talk amongst yourselves. So anyway, part of the um, Senior Shore Leadership course, we talk about, I get the privilege of, of teaching the NEPA Natural and Cultural Resources class. And so when we were talking about giving an overview to the folks in the room about what, what we do every day, I thought this was a good, um, a good kind of brief to go through. And I'm not going to go through every slide because what I'm trying to articulate to the small group of natural resources people in the room, as well as the cultural resources people that were not here on Sunday, is that we, we sit down and we talk with the commanding officers and we try and give them a message of what they need to remember when they get to their bases um, in order to be effective commanding officers. And you realize this is a three-week course that's been smooshed into kind of two and a half, two weeks, and it's, um, it is like the fire hose of classes. And, and really the, the goal is to get the commanding officers to remember something enough so they'll look it up. Like I think that's the, <laughs> the major goal because they're getting every single type of training you could possibly imagine, human resources, ordinance. Captain State, though, she went through the class. I mean, I mean it, it, it's crazy, isn't it? It's just like boom, 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 and they're working nonstop for like three days. It's, it's crazy. I mean, for three weeks, it's crazy. So we're just trying to give them an overview of these statutes. We talk about NEPA. We talk about types of NEPA documents. You know, I've had a CO um, who I love dearly, so I'm not saying this in a bad way, that called a Fonzie, you know, he thought Fonzie was from Happy Days. So we kept saying Fonzie, and he was just like, what are you talking about? You know, so this is good, you know, good information. What triggers NEPA, how NEPA works, how NEPA relates to, um, to other laws, <clears throat> how it's done overseas, what they need to con consider in NEPA cultural resources preservation statutes, natural resources protection statutes, other laws and regulations that they have to consider in the NEPA process. And then we talk about cultural resources, where we highlight that it's not the same as all the other environmental programs, that we have a different program sponsor. And then we talk about the main laws, the National Historic Preservation Act, Archaeological Resource Protection Act, NAGPRA, um, Native American Graves and Protection, Protection and Repatriation Act. We talk about ICRIMPS talk about INFADS, and this is really important because we kind of drive home with INFADS that in order for you to have good planning on your base so you can do what you want to do, you need to have up-to-date INFADS. So it kind of puts that, that concept into their head that they, they are charged with this as well. And then we talk about the metrics. And then I think this is probably the most important part of what we teach um, them. It's what questions you ask the installation, um, the CR manager. Um, and we do the same for natural resources. We talk about Sykes Act and the Integrated Natural Resources Management Plans. I certainly hope for those of you that are cultural resources folks in the room and the CPLOs, you know what an Integrated Natural Resources Management Plan is. If you don't, then call me and we will have a one-on-one -on -one class about it for at least eight hours because I am an expert and I can talk about it for a very, very long time. Um, 
The, the point here, though, is that integrated natural resources management plans are really the foundation for our programs, and they feed other documents which are hugely important, such as EISs, TAP planning documents, and the commanding officer is in, in saying when he signs or she signs a document that they are agreeing to what's in this document as the natural resources management program and that they have mutual agreement from the state, Fish and Wildlife Service, and sometimes NOAA. Um, it is hugely important for our mission side of the house because it does help us sometimes on the exclusion of um, critical habitat. Um, so it becomes a very, very important statute for us. There are definitely parallels between integrated natural resource management plans and um, culture resource, integrated culture resource management plans. But one of the things that we've had to do in the past um, couple of years, I guess, is make sure that our integrated natural resources management plans address not only lands that we own, but lands that we use via license permit or lease and withdrawn lands. I think the first round we didn't do the best job defining what our resources are and then how they should be protected. The other thing that we're doing now is we're making sure that our nearshore environments are addressed. And I know that gets to be a very, very um, gray, gray area when it comes to at sea ranges. I'm going to answer the question right now. We're not doing integrated natural resource management plans for at sea ranges. We're doing it for the near shore environment. So, um, Sykes Act has 10 required elements. This just kind of gives you a highlight of those. If you're not a natural resources person, you'll see that um, you know, it, it does include educational outreach, enforcement, so um, a lot of dealing with the community because if you're talking about ecosystem management, you need to make sure that you're understanding what's going on outside the fence and what's going, how that affects you. And with climate change um, and the requirements in the new DODI to address climate change, I think that's going to become even more important, how we're communicating with our, our neighbors. And the most, important of the, the most important part of the Sykes Act is the requirement to ensure a no net loss and the capability of the military installation lands to support the mission. That's the purpose of an interrupt. Bottom line, you're making a plan that's integrating the natural resources management with the military mission. It's not a bugs and bunny document. It is the integration of mission and natural resources. So then we have ESA issues, lots of ESA issues. If you saw any of the briefs this week, you'll, you've seen that slide that, that's put out that talks about the fact that the 30 million acres of DOD lands has almost the most endangered species with the Navy you know, leading the way because of our coastal assets. But it's important for commanding officers to understand uh, that there are endangered species and you can't bump them on the head and how the process works and what the terms are, take, and what that means to them. Then we kind of show them the imperiled species distribution map, which is a little bit older, but um, it gets the message across. If you look at Navy installations, they're kind of where all those little orange dots are, so that becomes an issue because those are where the imperiled species are. Uh, this is the the graph I was talking about that shows the DOD lands in comparison to the number of listed species we have. And then the big issue that we want to drive home with the commanding officers is that you need to make sure that somebody in your in for shop, however you choose to delegate that, um, is tracking potential ESA requirements on your installation. So if you have any proposed designations, proposed critical habitat, uh, designations, proposed listed species, our expectation is that we're responding to that. And I, I think it's good for everybody in this audience to understand that this is an exceptionally important issue to the Secretariat. And the reason that it is so important is because the original NDAA language that got us the exclusions for our integrated natural resources management plans on DOD lands <coughs> because of our integrated natural resource management plans was absolutely, you know, the head flag holder in that whole effort was the Navy. And so it, it's almost like a personal, and I, I don't mean this in a bad way, it's, a, it's like almost a personal attack against the Navy if we get designation of critical habitat, because we were definitely the energy behind that law uh, moving forward, and it's, it's a big deal. So that's why it is a very, there's a secretariat memo on it, how, how it works. Um, you have, if you're going to respond to a federal designation, it has to go through N4, and that's not your N4, that's CNO N4. So usually when it happens, it has to be dealt with very quickly. Then we have Migratory Bird Treaty Act issues. Of course, this is a big issue in the Navy because of FDM. Um, it resulted in the final rule. And there's a lot of issues related to this that I think we're not doing a good job addressing in our integrated natural resource management plans. So we need to make sure that our integrated natural resources management plans are doing justice to migratory birds. Because when we have issues like Boardman, 
where we're talking about doing a range EIS and we haven't adequately addressed the migratory birds in the EIS because our in-rumps are short on the information, then when it gets to the military readiness rule and the issue of significance, it gets complicated. That's just gonna, and then we talk about Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, primarily because it's a new issue with the recent delisting of the, um, the bald eagle, the issue of permitting the take of bald and golden eagles has become an issue and on our, on our western installations, I think it might become a little bit of a um, hiccup. I guess we'll have to see what the Air Force, um, what the Air Force situation is. Then obviously the Marine Mammal Protection Act, we highlight that, uh, that issue and the fact that, that it is also something that they need to be focused on and it requires a great deal of coordination <laughs> with CNO and 45. Nearshore environmental issues are always big, um, you know, on Navy bases. The nearshore areas, essential fish habitat, and obviously coral reef. Coastal Zone Management Act, and then we have our own in rent metrics. You know, the Cultural Resources Program is leading their way with uh, their metrics, but we've had our metrics. I will say to the natural resources folks in the audience, we're in the process of reviewing the questions and updating them so that they're ready and out in the fall. So hopefully they'll be better. I'm going to say that again. They will be better. Finger, they are going to be better because I've hated them since 2000 and blah, 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 so. So this is the other thing that I really like about the, um, the, the, the brief is that we, you know, we explained to the COs, these are the questions you have to ask. And because we had these questions in our brief, um, they put together this handbook for the COs that kind of says when you get there, <laughs> these are the questions that you need to ask. So yeah, it, it's very helpful. So um, this kind of is the overview that says this is how you make sure you have good environmental planning and, and that's, that's just one element of the overall, um, the program recently is that new, new issue. And I don't know how to make this go away. I'm just gonna talk off notes. The 5090, as it's being updated, will address near shore issues and processing integrated natural resources management plans a bit better. Um, once the 5090 is done, which should be in September, October, we've been tasked by CNO to update the in-rump guidance. So I, I do appreciate for many of the installations out there that the integrated natural resource management plan guidance is confusing in some realms and it does need to be updated and I appreciate that. But until the 5090 is done, we really, we need to wait on the in-rump guidance to be updated. That said, if you have any questions about an in rump that's happening in the next several months, be sure to ask me and we can certainly work towards what the expectations are for the new, uh, the new guidance. Um, in rumps in general, I will say, uh, we have a requirement out there that the integrated natural resources management plans get sent up to CNIC for review. And I, I'm the lucky soldier that gets to review them. I guess I should say sailor. Um, and for lack of a better way of saying it, they haven't been the greatest. And so I will tell you that it's very disturbing to me because that shows a lack of ownership over integrated natural resource management plans. And if you don't have ownership over those plans, then you're not gonna be able to support the mission and you're not gonna be able to ensure the exclusion of critical habitat. And so I just ask that when you go back to your installations, you really focus on making sure that those plans are doing your base justice and that they do represent what your installation commanding officer, your regional commander desire for that asset. Because right now, I don't think they're meeting the mark. And I'd remind you all that the 5090 clearly states it's the installation commanding officer's responsibility to make sure that that document's done. And so it's, it's you're representing them in the completion of that document. So at this point, because the ones we've been seeing have not been good, I'm asking to see all the in rumps, complete in rumps, because if I look at an in rump and I know it's out of date and I've been away from the field for almost two years now, there's a problem. So just really focus on your integrated natural resource management plans. Um, Jamie, at what point would you like to see them? Ask the Fish and Wildlife Service and the state agency? No, because I don't want to affect the contracting process. So usually it's, we're not sending a lot of them out for public review, but it's usually before the public review part. Because I don't want to influence, I mean, if you guys are moving right along and then I just throw a wrench in the system, that doesn't help out any, any either. And I'm going to give you a little bone here, but it's just a bone, small bone. Um, we are also uh, trying to figure out maybe better ways to do the NEPA for in -rumps. Everybody's supposed to break out loud cheers, right? Thank you very much. 
okay, look, I am not the, Navy, the Secretary of the Navy, and there's a memo that expressly says that we do NEPA on NRUMPS. And so if you would like to talk, you know, to Ms. Van and Steele or Ms. Mr. Chagardis and get them to rewrite that memo, then, well, you go right ahead. <laughs> what? I think, um, I think we're working towards something that might work out a little bit better and makes more sense, but I'm just saying if you're having problems and you're struggling with NEPA, then let's talk about it instead of you wrenching your hands in the field because I don't think the intent was to make this as hard as it is. I'll, I'll just say that. Um, that said, with natural resources metrics, you, you heard mention that, I, that we're redoing the natural resources metrics. If you're meeting with your regulatory agencies in the next couple months, we're going to have to figure out a way to deal with the fact that you're answering the old questions. The old website should be closed. You should not be able to access the old website. We're going to talk about the new website in a minute. So if you plan on doing your natural resources metrics before September, I probably need to talk to you about that. Um, POM, uh, thank you all for supporting POM 14. I, I very much appreciate it. And then I want to make sure that those folks in the room know that the hard work that you did for natural resources in 2012, um, for POM 12, pardon me, uh, resulted in what is unheard of today, and that's a program of record increase for natural resources. In, in, um, on, this, on the natural resources side, we got a $12 million increase. That's amazing. In today's budget terms, that is unheard of. And it was because we, went, we did a lot of work, we defended our program, and the we primarily being Kelly, in this scenario. But we validated and we put it in the system. Um, and she did a lot of hard work and defended our program and, and I think rightfully so we're finally going to be able to deal with that bow wave that we've been dealing with since 2001. So um, I, I'm very excited about that. I will say and I will emphasize probably a, a program goal that Bill mentioned and that's if we don't have a way to execute those funds then they will be certainly taken away. So for those of you that primarily support execution in the room we need to figure this out because if we don't execute this money, it's walking out the door. And this, and it, this is like your last chance. So um, I, I wouldn't mess with the chance that you've been given. Communication, um, I've been working with uh, NAFAC headquarters to figure out a way to maybe do a monthly phone call. So I think we're going to probably institute that once execution season's over. Um, and then data calls. Um, well, in addition to that, uh, we have our new website and we'll show you that in a little bit. Um, and then the data calls, there's a rumor running afoot and I just kind of want to make sure that we deal with this rumor that there is no more DEPARC. And I think the accurate statement is that there will be data calls every year that get pushed up to the Secretariat and up to DOD, but we won't be having a DEPARC report, like the actual report, the glossy pretty report that gets sent up to Congress and it's like three inches thick. I don't think that's going to happen. And I think that was a cost savings effort. We still have to submit the data. We will be doing a DEPARC, but there won't be a DEPARC report handed out. So I think everybody heard that and they're like, woohoo, we don't have to do a DEPARC. <laughs> but that's not what it was. You just, we're not going to have a report. So that's that. Um, and that's really all I have. So I, I will turn it over to um, Commander Roach and we'll talk about any questions at the end. And the reason we're talking about questions at the end, I apologize, is because some folks have to leave today. So we're trying to get through some of this material before those folks have to leave. What's yours called, sir? Oh, there it is. Oh, perfect. All right. Thanks, Tammy. Um, for those of you, uh, th this is actually really great for me because I've not been in a room uh, with more people with an architectural background since I joined the Navy uh, about 12 years ago. I'm an architect, so the truth be in the background there. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I have all that background. I'm also a Civil Engineer Corps officer, which means I deal with facilities and installations, uh, among other things. Uh, and I deal with a lot of the threats to those facilities and installations. So you can see a common thread here. Um, we deal with a lot of buildings. That's my background. We deal with uh, threats. Installations exist uh, to support missions. And one of the ways that we like to think about that is uh, if those missions can't continue, the installation has limited viability. A lot of things that may threaten them um, go under the term encroachment. Uh, which has gotten a lot of bad rap at this conference, actually. So we've got uh, encroachment, we've got mission sustainment, mission compatibility, uh, 
different sides of the same coin. I'm going to talk a little bit about what encroachment is. Uh, I was asked to put a brief together, uh, just a general brief, uh, dealing with encroachment to summarize encroachment uh, for a few of our OPNAV folks. And that a few folks turned into a, a conference room of about 12 admirals, uh, another dozen or so senior, senior civil service members. And we wanted to give an, uh, an overview of our non-program of record. So uh, at CNIC, <coughs> we deal with encroachment hand in hand with NAFAC. So, uh, the similar problem that a lot of people seem to have, uh, what uh, environmental things does NAFAC do, what does CNIC do? Uh, encroachment is very similar to that, encroachment management. Uh, we work at the headquarters level, at the regional level, and at the installation level very directly with NAFAC. In fact, I've got regional community plans and liaison officers uh, at every U.S. region. So I, I don't deal with Asia, I don't deal with Europe. Uh, but I do deal with everything both in CONUS uh, as well as Guam and Marianas. I deal with uh, all of the installations. We currently have installation CPLOs or community plans and liaison officers at uh, about half of our installations, a little under half. Uh, we're hoping to grow that. Uh, but that actually is very significant for us. Uh, the, the CPLO position started out as a very uh, informal NAVFAC type uh, position varied depending on where you were. CNIC codified that a little over a year ago in an instruction. And so now we have uh, a growing number of community plans and liaison officers. I'll talk a little bit about what they do. I'll talk a little bit about an overview of our current state of problems uh, and other initiatives that were underway and where we're going. So uh, without a whole uh, further ado, I, I will say this is a, a very quick top level overview. Uh, encroachment 101, what are our challenges? Uh, how do they impact our missions? Uh, a lot of people may not be familiar with uh, what a lot of our bases are doing uh, and what are those the threats to those missions. Uh, I'll talk about where we stand today and we'll show kind of the infamous dashboard. Uh, my boss, uh, or my boss's 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 boss, Admiral Vitale, uh, loves dashboards. So. Uh, if your boss is interested, you're fascinated by it, we have dashboards. Uh, but we'll talk about how that relates back to our encroachment management instructions uh, and where they stand. So, uh, and I'll give a few takeaways. <clears throat> so this is an eye chart, but it'll give you a little idea of a lot of the things that we deal with are actually a lot of the things you deal with. Uh, our encroachment instruction, uh, the CNIC encroachment instruction, goes back to a 2007 OPNAV instruction. And then if you follow it back to a number of other related instructions, uh, I've got about two dozen uh, pieces of paper that fill a four inch thick binder. Uh, and that really comes back to about the early 1970s with the AQs program. So you'll start to see all these acronyms. You can see that box off to the right. Uh, if you thought environmental was hard, now I'm gonna deal with uh, a whole bunch of different acronyms, but a lot of them overlap. Uh, Air Installations Compatibility Use Zones was a uh, federal program that was initiated in the early 70s. Uh, and then we had a, a really nice thick instruction that stood unchanged for, I think, 27 years, something like that. Uh, but it deals with air stations and specifically what are compatible uses around air stations. Uh, as you know, we have uh, issues with uh, particular overlap in environmental concerns with uh, air stations. but uh, we have very specific uh, issues with urban development. Um, that's a huge one. So that really made it as one of our top 14 encroachment concerns. So again, thinking about where our air stations are and how they've developed urban development around our air stations was a huge concern. A related concern to that, of course, noise. Uh, you can see some overlaps with environmental there. Uh, competition for air, land, and sea space. Uh, we're competing with everybody, everything out there for the use of some very limited space. Uh, many of our installations, of course, are in urban environments, as you know. Others are just near the littoral in places where people want to be, near the beach, uh, near uh, just really nice, expensive real estate. Um, and many of our missions are, in fact, not at all complementary with what someone's vacation home might want to be. Uh, but we compete with scarce resources as well. That's particularly a common in the West where we've competed uh, for years for water. Uh, the near littoral, as, uh, as Tammy mentioned, these are areas just offshore where we're competing now for, uh, again, just rights to move through the water. 
we're also seeing a growing interest in energy development. Uh, if you asked a few years ago, that would have been oil and oil leases. Uh, now it's wind. Uh, where it will be in the future, not sure. Uh, the erection of power lines uh, offshore and connected to the shore from wind turbines, uh, all are potential threats. Uh, all may impact our operations, but we don't quite know how, so we need to study that. Uh, threatened and endangered species, everyone's favorite wildlife habitat. Uh, and this is a really common area where we overlap with the environmental and the cultural resources community, and yet, uh, we don't do enough talking. <clears throat> I sit on the same floor as our environmental people, and in fact, when I walk in in the morning, I say, good morning, environmental. Uh, I get in there a little after 7 o'clock. Most of the environmental folks are already there. And so they, uh, they're there, and they're there sometimes after I leave. I put in a pretty long day. Um, I, I, I'm a 24-7 kind of person wearing the uniform. The environmental folks are <laughs> they're on the phone to Europe in the morning, and they're on the phone to uh, Guam and Japan in the afternoon. So. Uh, and into the evening. So we, we're there and we're talking, but we're not sharing a lot of that information. And part of the problem is that we are, we'll talk about the same bases. We have the same triggers for studies. Uh, we're doing environmental impact statements for missions. That will also affect noise, use of space. Um, an interesting thing right now, we, we have some of our areas with the largest problems. Uh, we focus on one aspect of that. If I talk about the Boardman Range, we talk about wind development. I have uh, three state listed species in the Boardman area. I have one that was just fast tracked. It's one of the 251 that got fast tracked under ESA. And I have the cutest little Oregon uh, Washington ground squirrel, excuse me. Um, and we have the last remaining uh, 74,000 acres of its habitat in Washington state. Everything around there is crop circles. And it's migrated onto our, uh, our ranges. Um, the good story there is that we fly above those ranges. We don't bomb them anymore. Uh, the ground squirrel likes to burrow and dig around uh, the unexploded ordnance, and it doesn't tend to set much of it off. So we've got some pretty good compatible use there. Uh, but that's not always the case, and it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that we're a success story. Uh, we have missions that will continue to change. Uh, we have maritime issues. Uh, that same range is part of a Northwest Training Ranges complex. Uh, we have offshore ranges that CNIC doesn't particularly um, have any authority over, but we certainly have local communities that are interested, and we're the face of the Navy, and they're often uh, who they come to. Uh, we have a lot of issues right now just outside of our installations, for instance, in Puget Sound. Uh, they're cultural and they're natural. Uh, we have uh, some testing areas where uh, we deal with the local tribes. The salmon that are taken there are cultural assets to some of those local tribes. And so there are some particular issues there in how we manage uh, the use of those areas uh, for our missions, for our testing missions, as for, well as for our operational missions. Uh, and then the usual uh, suspects that are everybody's problem. Exploded, uh, unexploded ordnance, uh, safety arcs, again, when we store munitions or we use munitions, uh, that creates safety zones. Uh, that's a problem for us when they extend beyond our uh, pot potential areas of interest. Uh, frequency spectrum, we deal with that less in terms of the communications issues, but we certainly deal with it uh, in terms of our radar issues uh, and wind particularly with wind turbines, uh, air and water quality, uh, environmental regulations, uh, interagency coordination. We don't deal well with coordination. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't always know what other people are up to, and we spend the same resources doing the same thing on slightly disconnected time frames, and we're not always great at sharing that information. Not because we don't want to, but because we often don't know who else is working on that information. So I spend a lot more time talking with our energy people. They sit on the other side of my, uh, my area, environmental on one side, energy on the other side. Uh, and then just legislative initiatives. That's, that's really huge. Uh, we see not just federal, but we see state legislative initiatives, and that is a uh, a huge reactionary mode. We're not l actively seeking out that information as well as we could. But what that all means for us is we don't do our mission as well. We have less ability to do it. We can't do it in the areas we like. We have less access to certain ranges. Uh, we can't operate in a realistic way that simulates how we would operate normally in a mission uh, in a hostile environment. So uh, that, that's a problem for us. 
How do we manage it? That, there's our little yellow box. Uh, community planning or community plan and liaison officers. You'll hear the Marines, the Air Force, and the Navy talk about that acronym a little bit different. Uh, but these are your forward observers. These are people out in the field. They operate a lot like, uh, in many cases, you do. They go to community meetings. They gather information. They understand who wants to do what. They get heckled. Uh, they get accused of being uninvolved. And they keep a straight face and take a lot of that information back. But they develop the relationships with the communities that are important in order to sustain our mission and to show that we're not the bad guy. We are actually interested in what the communities want and we don't often know what they want, so we're collecting that information. Uh, we create EAPs, encroachment action plans. We look for areas that conflict with our mission. We look to see how they conflict, and we look to see how we might interact with our local communities, with our state governments, with other agencies, with NGOs. Uh, we do a lot of encroachment partnering based on that. Most people wouldn't realize that some of our uh, larger ranges, some of our larger areas, we work very closely with the Land Trust, with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we do a lot of work with OSD through environmental, uh, through the REPI program. Uh, in fact, Navy has been very uh, singularly successful at getting a lot of money to protect uh, a lot of our missions while at the same time protecting a lot of the habitat around our installations uh, through that REPI program. AQs, again, we do studies uh, fairly frequently. Uh, for our air stations to understand what are compatible use zones around them. Uh, we've been very successful at dealing uh, with areas. Uh, in the back, I'll, I'll, I'll point to the gentleman in the far corner in the orange shirt. Uh, Randy Roy is one of our community plans liaison officers. Uh, he, he's worked at Whiting Field for how many years now, Randy? Three, Three years. Uh, comes from the operational background, but what makes that kind of special is he understands what the air station does uh, on a different sort of level, but what has been very interesting to us is our uh, partnering for uh, encroachment management around Whiting Field. Uh, in fact, it's been so successful over really the last decade uh, that we have uh, the local county where uh, NAS Whiting Field and many of our outlying landing fields are located. Uh, the county officials uh, like to make an annual trip up to Washington, uh, and, and I got to visit while they uh, briefed uh, Mr. Leary's boss this year. and they had some very polite things to say about our efforts. Uh, more to the point, we've been very successful at protecting literally thousands of acres around Whiting Field. Uh, and we do it with partnerships with the county as well as the state. Uh, some of those are managed through private NGOs. Uh, the Florida Forever program, if people are familiar with it, uh, preserves a lot of green space in Florida. We've been very successful at uh, submitting uh, partnered projects with uh, REPI initiative. And we have, in indeed protected the, both the north and the south uh, fields, two fields uh, composed Whiting Field, the, the air station. Uh, and that will, that will continue. Uh, we hope to expand that to other areas. Uh, but CPLOs are key to that effort as well as uh, environmental folks. We need to know whom we can partner with. Uh, we're very successful uh, with the Nature Conservancy. We're less successful with a lot of the smaller partners and a lot of the smaller governments. Uh, we're interested in protecting habitat because a lot of that habitat extends the range of uh, critters or creatures that might otherwise uh, take refuge on our installations. But we're also interested because it provides buffer zones around our installations where noise might be an issue or urban growth might be an issue. We're just seeing compatible growth. Uh, so those are areas where we seek to partner. Uh, range uh, or RACUs or rare range air installations, compatibility use zones. Uh, we drop a lot of things from the sky, a lot less than we did before, but we still have air to ground ranges, and we look for compatibility around those as well. Uh, in those areas, we do do encroachment partnering. Uh, JLIS, people might be familiar with uh, joint land use studies or joint land use surveys, some call them, but study is proper, uh, are things that we work with the Office of Economic uh, uh, OEA, the <laughs> Office of Economic Development, but through um, the JLUS program, we partner with local officials, local agencies to uh, ultimately uh, do plans that assure compatible development. And we hope to get them written into municipal code. We've been very successful around Oceana as an example of where JLUS has worked quite well. Uh, and we've done them all around the Gulf Coast. Uh, so the southeast region has uh, very successful 
JLIS is already underway. We've got two in Santa Rosa County, actually. We've got Whiting Field, but we also have uh, a joint Santa Rosa, uh, Okaloosa, Walden County, I think, JLIS around Eglin. Uh, and that's protected, uh, again, thousands of acres by assuring compatible development. The counties zone areas, uh, they control certain development concerns, they protect uh, fragile uh, ecology as well as our missions. So we contribute to the economy. Uh, these natural areas also contribute, uh, and they're very interested in working with us on that. So uh, some great overlaps. Uh, we need to, as a takeaway from this slide, work more closely with uh, those who are also working off of the installation with the local environmental community, with other NGOs who might span uh, into the local county, state, uh, and who are interested in partnering with the Navy. Uh, we have mutual goals. Some of the hot spots that we have right now, um, we, we compete everywhere for air, land, and sea. Uh, the country just simply has grown. Uh, we are all looking to use the same space, whether that's air, whether that's land, or the ocean. Um, Boardman was a subject that it, it's a hot one this year. It may not be next year. It certainly wasn't a few years ago. Uh, AMOA, by the way, is a military operating area, so it describes restricted airspace. Uh, in some ways, it describes uh, the air corridors that lead there. Uh, it doesn't talk necessarily about the land beneath it, uh, but the landowners beneath that airspace are very concerned with their land. Uh, we have a lot of growth for uh, sustainable energy. Uh, if any of you have been to some of the presentations this week, uh, you'll understand that there is friction, uh, and people do not necessarily share the same opinion uh, of energy development as it relates to mission. So. Uh, that is a continuing problem for us to understand the impacts to our missions. Uh, we're not opposed, but we do want to understand that we have uh, some compatible interest. Uh, frequency spectrum, uh, it's a huge issue for our radar sites. Uh, they are uh, being impinged on, in many cases, uh, by uh, reflected energy from wind turbines. So uh, many of these turbines, as they spin, uh, they're larger in profile than a 747, and they reflect things back at you. It's like putting a big ceiling fan in it and shooting rubber bands at it. Uh, much of that reflected energy can come back to our radar systems, confuse them, uh, lead to false images or uh, trip early warning systems for weather events. Uh, so we are definitely concerned about that. Urban development continues to be an issue. Uh, we're managing it, again, effectively around a lot of areas. Uh, Oceana, we're managing it effectively. Uh, not so well around Key West. Uh, we have some very fragile, uh, low-lying key areas, mangrove uh, protected areas. We fly above them. We don't damage them. Uh, but they're very popular for development of vacation homes. And unfortunately, uh, the local county, Monroe County in Florida, doesn't do a, an adequate job protecting that. Uh, and they would like to see them continued uh, to be developed. So we would like to protect them uh, as they are and fly above them. Uh, vacation homes, which are built uh, in many cases by some very wealthy individuals, uh, do produce a lot of tax revenue, unfortunately, for the county. And so those goals are not always shared with local developers, uh, but are shared uh, through certain coalitions like Florida Forever. And then finally, the legislative initiatives. Uh, we talk a lot about environmental initiatives, uh, NDAA. Every year, uh, look at the National Defense Authorization Act. It's very large, but there's a few sections that will stand out to your community. Uh, for us this year, it was Section 358, wind energy development, uh, which might be incompatible. It placed a lot of legislative burden on us uh, in terms of complying with uh, certain provisions of that. We're still trying to understand much of what that means uh, in terms of time and effort, uh, but it means more than we were doing before. And that usually is uh, on the part of our mission components, uh, and then we support them uh, with analysis. Uh, the American Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act, uh, potentially a great thing for the economy, but it also uh, spurred development in areas that were uh, potentially uh, quiescent for a while, nothing much going on, and suddenly there's an interest. Uh, it funded our construction as well as Department of Energy uh, grants, loans to, uh, for development that may or may not be compatible with us. But as opposed to long-term analysis, we had very short-term analysis on that. So we had to decide whether or not it impacted us, and we often had a very limited amount of time to do so, and we certainly didn't have all of the resources that we needed. So um, that, was, that was a change. 
uh, as of this past year. Um, ARA dates back to 2009, but many of the timelines in there in the legislation we, were, we really weren't paying too much attention to. And some of those timelines are uh, coming to a close. So developers are very much uh, under pressure to get those funds and show certain milestones. And so they may not, or they, we hope they will, but they are not always uh, as willing to talk to us uh, and negotiate uh, because there's money at stake. So uh, the dollar is driving many of these issues. So here's an eye chart. I can almost beat uh, Tammy's chart of the CNO's org chart, but uh, I won't try to explain all this, but the red, yellow, green just indicate different areas of our instructions that we're tracking across the entire uh, scope of CNIC's uh, installations. So what we didn't, again, look at, and, and I'll say we didn't look at Europe, we didn't look at Asia, but we did look at all of our U.S. installations, and we wanted to see how well we were doing uh, with certain encroachment factors. Uh, and you'll see that a lot of that is yellow. We can't really rate it. We have some issues, but we're not doing exceptional. But where the red stands out are areas where we're not really doing terribly well. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we don't have good people or we're not doing great efforts, but we have new challenges in some of these regions. Um, I, I won't throw uh, the uh, Naval District Washington people or the uh, Northwest people under the bus too much, but simply put, they had some new challenges and not enough resources to really address, to answer the mail. Uh, we had limited staff, uh, and we highlight that as we had only one full-time community plans and liaison officer on board. Uh, we had studies that were in some cases out of date, or uh, we had not worked well with local communities to establish compatible uh, guidelines that we would hope to see them adopt into law. So we just simply weren't there. Uh, we were very silent uh, on the issue of community involvement, and that created other problems. If you don't have anybody, uh, you can't manage studies. You can't do further research. You can't interact and share information. Uh, long and short, we've, uh, again, continued to grow the Community Plans and Liaison Officer Program. We are in the process of hiring two additional CPLOs, and we have funded two others. And we hope to see many of those reds turn at least into yellows, if not greens. But it takes time to develop those relationships and share that information. And as you know, uh, many EISs, and we share in those EISs, we share information, uh, they'll go on for years. Uh, we have several in the Northwest. Uh, a lot of that information will result in recommendations uh, to further improve uh, certain interaction. Uh, that's done through people, and the money available to do that is limited. We share a lot of the information uh, that you are uh, also looking at. Uh, we share a lot of those interests, uh, the interims, uh, other EIS type information. Uh, it feeds directly into our encroachment management plans. So uh, again, the interaction between your staff uh, and your codes and community plans and liaison officers is critical to both of our jobs, which is ensuring the mission is compatible. Uh, ensuring that we can continue the viability of installations. Uh, I was always asked, you know, how much money do we spend and where do we spend it? Uh, we don't break it out in ways that we've been asked to. Uh, so everyone wants to know, the famous question is, you know, how much money did you spend last year or how much will you spend next year uh, on coffee when you're thinking about solving my problem? Uh, we have about $15 million in our budget this year. But the interesting point to, to mention is that, again, we're not a program of record at CNIC. We don't have a fundamental one resource sponsor. But we draw from various resource sponsors in the Navy and then directly from OSD. Actually, a lot of encroachment money that we execute with NAFAC comes from the DOD REPI program. So it all goes to encroachment and encroachment partnering, but it does not necessarily uh, get tallied against how much money was spent against airborne noise or competition for space. We like to think a lot of the money spent has multiple benefits. And uh, so in this sense, we had a hard time breaking this chart up, but we would say that most of our money spent this year uh, is spent on CPLOs and their efforts in turn on encroachment partnering. And it deals a lot with competition for space. And that shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, some, again, incompatible uses, urban development, noise around our air stations. Uh, and a big one, really, uh, if we could look at it, is frequency spectrum. Uh, we're being asked a lot about radar issues. 
we're the installations command. We don't really do a whole lot with that, but we certainly have a lot of interest from our air stations. Uh, whether it's proper to split it out that way, I put a, lot, a big squiggly line in front of every one of those and said, Admiral, sir, we don't, and we have never broken out our information in that way. We don't have those funding codes. Uh, but the truth here is that we're not spending a lot of money on water quality or air quality issues for encroachment. Um, we certainly see that money spent by the environmental folks. Uh, we're not spending it within our program. Uh, so you see a bunch of blanks in there where we're really not spending our money on transportation issues per se, uh, not really a uh, hot item of the moment. So uh, those hot items, uh, set the squeaky wheels, if you will, tend to get the dollars. Um, takeaways for this, when, when we're managing things, we don't have years anymore, we have months. So we don't have the long decade-wide growth that you see with an endangered species uh, of concern, uh, for instance. We have projects that are going to be built uh, next to our installations uh, very, very quickly, uh, and that may not have many permitting, permitting requirements. Uh, we're often in rural areas in the county, uh, and the county doesn't have a zoning code, doesn't have any uh, formal review authority actually at all. And so many of these, uh, if they're small homes, if they're uh, small uh, incompatible developments, we may not be aware of them uh, unless we're sharing information and we're literally out there asking people in the community. Uh, encroachment management is a team effort. So uh, I stress it not just for our operational folks, but also for our installations folks. Uh, it seems we talk more and more with our operators at the fleet level, uh, also in the testing and evaluation community, and we don't uh, tend to spend enough time uh, sharing coffee with the environmental people uh, to understand their studies that are underway and what they're finding and what their key problems are, which may be our key problems, whom they've talked with regionally, locally, tribally. We don't, we don't often know that information. Uh, so when I get a report back and Tammy says, have you reviewed this? I say, I, Tammy, I haven't seen it. Uh, we're not on that task or we, we just don't get a copy of that. And she'll say, well, you need, you need to look at it. it. It's kind of small. And I need, and I need your comments back by Tuesday. It's Monday, Tammy. But anyway, we, we need to share a lot of that information better than we're doing. Um, for our operators, we're, we, we haven't done enough to document their mission impact. So it's not enough anymore. Um, we've been slapped on the hand. It's not enough to say uh, it bothers us or talk in adjectives. We have to do more measurement. Uh, environmental folks have measured for a while. Uh, our operators have measured their effectiveness and their training, but they haven't really uh, measured the impacts between the two. So how does a decrease or how does this environmental pressure, how does this encroachment pressure potentially decrease your mission impact or how has it? Uh, the record keeping is spotty. So that, that again has to improve. Uh, and we're not doing the sustained engagement that we need to be. In many cases, uh, again, I say through CPLOs, it can be through uh, a lot of different eyes and ears and voices in the community. But our CPLOs, we talk to them to the, uh, the operational forces as the soft power. They are the forward observers uh, in the way many of our operators would talk. But they are also, simply put, the eyes and ears. Uh, environmental folks are out there in the community just as frequently, if not more so. And that information that you collect uh, shared with others who are working similar problems will help achieve a lot of these goals beyond the fence line. Uh, and again, some of the challenges, multiple resource sponsors, overlapping requirements and limited funds. We can leverage a lot of those limited funds because we're working on similar studies. So we need to be able to take a lot of the information and summarize it succinctly. Uh, as a uh, a point, I got a 168-page encroachment action plan for the Northwest Training Ranges complex, and that encroachment action plan uh, had, I think, three pages of executive recommendations. Uh, and when I pass something up to our front office, I'm allowed to put something in 12-point font, uh, and I get one page, and it's all in bullets. So I need to find out how to take that information and make it digestible up to the front office. And usually I get it back scanned with the Admiral's comments, uh, and he writes questions on it, but they usually end up as why or how. So he is interested, he does see it, uh, and we need to be able to figure out how to take a lot of that information and, and bring it to the right people quickly. Uh, we can do that at CNIC. We get a lot of that uh, information. The most important thing 
that when you bring these large reports back to us, hey, point out, what do we need to look at? What is, what's your executive finding on there? Uh, I do find that in a lot of what we receive from, uh, from the regions, from the lower echelons, as, uh, as Tammy pointed out, um, you may think we have a lot of time to go through a lot of these documents. Um, we don't. The front office has less. Uh, please help us understand the issues of greatest concern and see where they overlap. So we can take that. And that's my brief presentation. Okay. So real quickly, you're going to talk about the 5090, just because I know there was a lot of people who commented on it. Um, the, um, I can't remember the actual number of comments that we received on the natural side. Uh, this is just a... Keep going. Back up. You're looking for the summary of comments? Yeah. It's two slides. That one? No, no, keep going back up. One more. So the bottom line is that um, there was 3,500 comments received on the document. The document comments were received from um, many commands. Uh, we're still in the process of reviewing and addressing the comments. On the natural resources side, um, the folks at headquarters, CNIC and, and NAFAC, are working to fix the culture resources chapter. And on the natural resources side, uh, we're working with N45 to fix the, the I'm sorry, the culture resource chapter on M45 on the natural resource chapter. I just wanted to quickly, because I know we're running out of time, show you the schedule. The bottom line is that we have to have our chapters done by September 16th, and that means they have to be pretty with a bow on them. And then they go um, through the chop chain for a very long time, this final document review. Um, they're sending it up the chain for two weeks to the secretariat level and other back out for review, but it won't go to the field level. That's just a OPNAV secretariat review. And then once that, done, once that is done, they'll submit it to DNS, um, which is the department that are experts in creating instructions. And then, then the whole process is, is expected to be done in July of 12. But... Um, if you have issues or questions about something that you read in the 5090 and you think it's going to be in the next 5090, I would certainly ask about it because it is going to be our guidance document for a long time. And I, I wouldn't, after all the work that's gone in to fix this 5090, I wouldn't expect it to change anytime soon. That's for sure. So, do you want to say anything else about 5090? Uh, no, I, I think yeah. that covers it. Um, I will say real quickly before I forget, because um, my brain is operating on empty at this point, that if you have not received an email from me about a natural resources issue in the next, past like two weeks, then you probably need to send me an email so I can add you to my distribution list. And Hillary, um, Hillary, in cooperation with Gail and Bill and I and Cheryl, we put out what's called the Culture Resources Circulator. And that document um, should have reached you all. Yeah, and let me just note that uh, because this session is being recorded for uh, you, a YouTube broadcast, it'll occur uh, this evening. No, it's, uh, seriously, it's important to talk to the microphone so we can actually get your question uh, on the tape. Okay. All right, well, if there's no questions, I'm going to wrap up. So we're in the process. You got a question? <laughs> You're too quick. That's a good way to make sure you have questions. I got to cut Tammy off. Um, <laughs> How long have you been working there? <laughs> long enough. For the commander, uh, with respect to, I know the, the focus of the conservation is on wildlife habitat primarily. Um, but obviously archaeological sites and other historic properties could be preserved through those actions. Has there been any discussion of that, contemplation of that? Let's see if I have this thing on. Um, at present, no, uh, but that is simply uh, because the REPI program exists for, uh, it has very specific authorities uh, under 
its mandate under law of what it can do for uh, environmental reasons. Now that said, uh, I, I don't know that it necess necessarily excludes uh, cultural assets uh, of, of that realm. It's a great question, and uh, I, I can talk with OSD about it. Well, ACUB has dealt with it a little bit. I know at least one example in Virginia um, where the Army's ACUB program dealt with it. And I used to work with a land trust in North Carolina that was really active with the Fort Bragg encroachment reduction. Um, and we entertained the idea a little bit. There are, there are some benefits potentially in uh, maybe reducing the pressure on the installation to preserve certain types of archaeological sites or properties if better examples exist off post uh, or off base that could be preserved through one of these uh, encroachment programs. And then you might also attract other partners, potential partners who are interested not only in wildlife conservation but uh, right. historic I, preservation. I, you know, we often do it when there is an overlapping uh, of both environmental and archaeological. So we, we're not saying we would exclude that. Um, I can point to an example in Southeast that we're putting in for a FY12 uh, repi submission, uh, which is Escribano Point, which is just off the uh, Choctaw OLF, uh, right at the southern tip of Santa Rosa County. Uh, that actually has known uh, Native American habitat uh, or Na Native American sites as well as endangered species habitat. So. Uh, it affects us because it's, again, right at the edge of the air station, uh, but it has uh, been already surveyed for uh, some cultural assets related to uh, original inhabitant. Um, I, I think there are some, uh, some shell middens and some other things. So it hasn't been fully explored, but it's definitely uh, of interest to uh, some of the Florida partners we've approached. Okay. Thank you. Just real quick before I forget them because we're running out of time. This is our new website. And no, we don't manage Yellowstone, but that would be cool, right? Uh, and so the new uh, website, this is where you'll find the culture resources metrics um, for review. But it is hosted by EMS Web, so we're trying to link the two. And we're trying to put other links on here. Uh, it'll probably be out in half force, maybe in the fall. But it, it is our new website, and we're trying to make it better, faster. Place The overall goal for the website is to make a, an area where you can manage your programs better and have the information there so that we can, we can get information from you, but at the same time, we can also um, we can see what you're doing. So you are using this to manage your program, and it's a place for you to have your data and also answer data calls without it being completely painful. And then the other little pitch I'm going to make for websites is the way of CNIC is the CNIC gateway. If you do not know about the CNIC gateway, um, it does have a lot of really cool information about your region and installations, and you should probably get um, an account. If you need to get an account, you can contact me. Th this is the way um, um, Commander Roach, he referred to it. Th this is Admiral Vitale's vision, and this is the way that we are going in CNIC. He bases everything off dashboards and metrics and units of measure, and it is a very valuable tool. I mean, we have facts and figures for all CNIC. You can do it regionally. You can do it by your bases. So it's, it is a helpful tool. So I'm sorry, Michelle, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. That just answered part of my question. So oh, that was helpful. Thank good you. For me. Um, my question, I sent it, you had asked for questions um, from the regions and from the installations, and I sent in a few. So I just wanted to try to get one in quickly. Um, I thought I answered most of them. Sorry. Um, it must be hard. <laughs> no, it's not a tough one. Um, we've talked about the newsletter and the websites, but I wanted to know now that we have a full staff at headquarters, NAFAC, and CNIC, um, what are some of the ways that you're going to try to facilitate communication better or more fully throughout um, the, the regions and the installations so that we can get find out more about what you all are working on up there in Washington. And so if we have ideas about some things that we think are emergent issues, we can get them up to you to see if you can work on them on our behalf. Are you talking cultural resources right now, Cultural Michelle? resources yeah. is what I'm talking I, about. I, I'll just say that I, I think the communication on the cultural resources um, side of the house all the way up to 1046. I mean, Commander George has been very gracious with his time. And um, I, I think that I would just simply say we have an open door policy. If you have an issue and you need to talk to us, then absolutely. And we communicate on a daily, hourly, minutely basis. So 
I, I think communication at our level is, is, is very good on the cultural resources side. But if there is an issue that you need to talk about, I mean, you can certainly send it up both chains and we can talk about it and get back to you. I, I certainly hope that everyone in this room feels welcome to contact us if they have an issue. Bill? I, well, Go I, I was going to say, for, for, for my take on that, um, you know, walk over to the desk and, and start talking. Uh, be forward about it. You know, I, I come over to uh, Tammy's desk. Sometimes I, with a cookie, you yeah. know, I, I have to, you know, kind of do a little bribe there for some time. But uh, we're all pretty busy, but nonetheless, um, with all the virtual working we're doing, sometimes we, we don't uh, have that inter interaction that we otherwise could. Uh, I would uh, redouble your efforts uh, with that in mind and don't wait for the formal infrastructure. Uh, we have a, a great number of ad hoc teams that are happening on many of our installations uh, simply because they have developed for one project and they have then carried on uh, as sort of uh, informal but living uh, exchanges of information. So I, I would encourage that. Uh, and Michelle, I would say, and to everyone, I would say that uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that you're going to feel a lot more engaged and, and have access to more information in the course of the next year. The, the communicator, is it the cir circulator? Is that what it's called? I'm sorry, did I get it wrong? Communicator, yes, I was right. Okay, good. The the newsletter uh, has is is growing. Hillary's doing a great job of of uh, increasing the amount of information, and the, we hope soon that that will be a two more of a two way communication. So we'll see more uh, news and issues from from uh, installations and regions. Uh, so I think that's going to grow in terms of a tool. Also, the 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 NAFAC headquarters website, the portal cultural resources site has more and more information all the time and we're looking to grow that. Uh, we also talked on Sunday and I think we're probably going to be able to pursue the idea soon of a, I don't know how often it's going to be, there's still some logistics to sort out, but a, a regular uh, conference call with folks. It, it won't be a requirement, it'll be an opportunity to talk about what's happening and obviously to uh, have some sort of mediated exchange of information in real time about about how things are going, and and there's still, uh, uh, honestly, I will just say that I think that, that the cultural resources metrics are going to be an occasion for a lot of communication uh, between headquarters and and regions and installations. Um, uh, as soon as it rolls out. I think one last thing is I think our meeting on Sunday was very valuable, and there's a lot of things we're taking from that meeting to to act upon, and I, I think that'll be helpful as well. As far as installation communication, though, I will put out a little plug that if anybody in the room is a CPLO and they don't know who their natural and cultural resources manager are, is are, then um, please go meet that person when you get home and get a tour of your installation from them because they know a lot about your base and you can learn a lot from them. And if the natural resources and cultural resources people don't know their CPLO, then go find them and find out what they do and give them a tour of your bases, base installations, regions, um, so that we can build that communication and networking because I think we really do have a lot uh, to offer one another and I bet we can probably reduce some of the additional work if we actually communicate it a little bit better. Anyone else have any questions? Uh oh, it's Alec. <laughs> uh, you can't escape the cultural resources. Um, You're outnumbered, right? Well, as someone new to the Navy, I think it's important to let you know that really since I arrived in January, I've, I've been able to hear and carry on the message that we're here to support the mission. Um, and it, something that's also become very clear is that we have more historic resources than we need to fulfill the mission. The, so the other piece that's been conveyed is we need to reduce footprint. Um, of course, when you have NHLs, that's not as easy as maybe some other installations, but I'm trying to find out, after listening to today's presentation, who sets the guidance for partnerships, particularly for partners that may not be federal or military, for, for taking over uh, stewardship of facilities inside the perimeter because of security. So how do I find out, or is there, do we need to change that or consider alternative ways to to meet that footprint reduction and also meet the cultural resources mission so that we can focus our dollars and our cultural resource efforts on facilities that are needed? It's a great question. It's a great, 
It's a great question, uh, and I don't really have a very complete answer, I'm afraid, but I, I think the place to start would be your uh, real estate asset management folks uh, to talk about the, you know, essentially the legal mechanism. I do believe, although I'm, I cannot cite off the top of my head, I do believe that we have expanded authority uh, to partner with uh, non-Navy uh, 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 organizations and, and uh, entities to, uh, to yeah. do that kind of work. I think, but it, it, obviously the specifics would, would matter a lot in terms of exactly what the requirements were. Yeah, I can actually uh, come into that a little bit. I, N44 that, that I sit in, in CNIC, uh, is asset management, and we actually work with end-use leases, and that falls under us. So end-use leases are one way that uh, we can very attractively look at uh, the reuse of Navy property. Uh, it's not necessarily something that we have done an enormous amount of, but we frequently see that in terms of uh, museum space, for instance, for historical buildings. Uh, if you've been to Fort Island, you've been in a few of these structures. She works at Fort Island. So uh, that is not uncommon, though, at some of our other uh, installations. Usually, uh, everybody wants to have something new from scratch. On the other hand, it doesn't preclude the local bank branch or other things that benefit Navy missions. Uh, from being in historic structures. I would, um, I would talk with uh, Bob Meehan, and I can get you that information if you need it. Uh, he is the EUL manager at CNIC, and he can give you more information. I have two questions. One, um, I have a site that's eligible um, that is eroding out into the bay. Um, it is also undermining uh, several large oak trees, and it is um, utilized as a rec area. Is there any way to pool money? Uh, you mean an outdoor recreation area? When you recreation, say rec MWR site. Um, uh, any way to pool the money to uh, shore up and uh, stop the erosion process, and is there a mechanism to put in uh, to request funding for such a project? If that was a tough question last year, or the last pump cycle that we had about whose responsibility is it to pay for um, the erosion issue. Uh, and I will say that when it came down to brass tacks, it, w it was facilities as a facilities cost. But if you're having a compliance issue, it, it kind of comes over to culture resources. So in the end, it kind of goes to the same program sponsor. So I, I think we probably need to talk a little bit more about it on a site uh, site-dependent basis, but um, we de it's definitely something we need to discuss. Bill, you want to say anything? Well, I think that, I think that's right. And again, not knowing anything about the specific situation, uh, I can tell you that I've worked on, I've done the cultural resources review on projects where various uh, uh, kinds of shore stabilization, you know, erosion stabilization projects have gone on. Is this in water? Did this be an in water? Part yeah. of it. Part of it is yeah. in water. Yeah. So yeah, it'll be a it'll be a, a multi uh, a faceted effort to make that happen. But I have seen it happen, you know, uh, uh, especially when especially and this may be the, the the critical question when the erosion has a defined mission impact. I mean, compliance issues when you're talking about natural forces like that are a little harder to to tie to a uh, a, 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 you know, a Navy action. It's it, not to say not to say it's irrelevant, but it's not quite the same as if we are going out and spending money to do something and affecting resources. Uh, so that may be part of the challenge to define how this how this affects the mission at that installation. But you'll definitely have natural resources, and I would assume 404 permitting issues uh, related to uh, to how to make that happen. We can talk about it when you get yeah. back and figure out who the right people are to have that conversation. And your other question? Other question is um, the uh, database uh, that you were talking about earlier. Are there any plans to um, take uh, historic maps and geo-reference them to be used in the GIS database system? Right now, uh, Laura Muse from NAFAC headquarters is working diligently on um, trying to integrate the environmental uh, geospatial information with um, our, the, the NAVFAC systems for how they manage uh, geo, geospatial information. And we're trying to pull that in into our new website. 
Um, I think her project is due to be done in a couple months. Sorry, it's supposed to be done in the fall, and I think once that once we get there in the fall, that we'll have more information on the way ahead. So if, I think if you give it a couple months, I think we'll get a little bit better. Um, but right now, we, we have a lot of little kinks to work out. I will say my general impression is that GIS management and data management associated with your, your program is a region by region, installation by installation dependent situation. Each region seems to do it a little bit differently, and um, which is a bit frustrating, but, but at that, that's the case right now. So hopefully we'll have a little bit more, more information in the fall. And it's a, by the way, Carrie, it's a great idea. And, and you know, you'll, I think in time, as Tammy said, you'll find ways to make that happen. That's, that'll be very valuable. Thank you. I don't think that's going to happen through what Laura's going to do. No, not through No, but Laura's it'll help define the process on how to get it done. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The problem is that Palm 14 closes tomorrow. So unless you have access to a computer. Am I up? Sure, go ahead, Rob. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious why the expectations of NROMPs to be up to date, quote unquote, or what I might call, for lack of a better term, kind of rigid when, in essence, when they're completed, they're already a dated document. Things change so fast that it's difficult to capture everything in a quote unquote up to date manner. And some of them take up to 10 years. One of them I've got now that I inherited you know, four months ago. Um, as soon as they're done, they're dated. It, in the same context, the implementation tables are very dynamic and living. We're trying to implement the things that we say in the NRUMPs, but some of the perspective on the bases and the acreage of, of habitats and things like that may change with a fire overnight and whatnot. And, um, and then we do revisions to them as well. And so I just struggle to see the importance of having them uh, to be completely up to date when it's difficult to balance all the comments, the, the, the contract, uh, you know, going out of scope when you come back with comments and it gets late and all that. It's just a very uh, difficult thing to accomplish them in, in, in a very linear form. And so having that expectation makes it that much more difficult. To quickly answer your question, because I talked about this for a long time. The the expectation is that the first round of integrated natural resource management plans have been done. And unfortunately, when that first round was done, we did those documents thinking that there would be five-year revisions because that's the way, at sure. the time, OSD and Navy interpreted the Sykes Act. The expectation now is that those documents are living documents that are being updated constantly, and there's a big push to update them annually. Right. Revisions are only going to be required if, if there's some sort of major change on your installation big huge changes of mission, you have new endangered species, I mean something that requires a big change. Right. Um, other than that, the requirement is to review as to operation and effect every five years with your, with your stakeholder, with the Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, and the state, right. and to gain mutual agreement at that time. Right. So you should be updating this document kind of as a process, and then at that five-year mark you can get new signatures, but you don't have to redo the whole thing if you don't need to. So the expectation, I think, in your mind is that we're doing these big documents every couple of years, and that's not really I, the expectation. Right. That said, I don't think there has been a clear, defined process on how to update them very well annually, and I, I, I think that's an installation and region independent issue. How they choose to do that is, is up to them. Um, but uh, until the bottom line is until our SIMS and geo readiness centers works a little bit better, I think we're always going to be in a situation where it's going to be installation and region dependent on how they want to, how they want to manage that process themselves. All right. Did that answer your question? Yeah. I that. can talk to you about yeah, it offline. We'll talk more, no doubt. Um, I do have integrated out. natural resource management plan guidelines um, up here if anybody's interested. And then I do also brought some climate change information from the Forest Service. They, they seem to be leading the way in, in how they're managing climate change. So I have two disks up here. and then. I bought my copy of Scanning the Conservation Horizon, which is a climate change book if anybody wants to look at it. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, well, I think you've, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jim. Well, you know, I always wait till the last minute and drag it out. Uh, we, we had a very good presentation yesterday uh, by Marie Cottrell on a, a regionalization of a uh, curation facility for the Marine Corps. I think it's a good model for us to start thinking about, especially for California, NAFAC Southwest having a major 
uh, uh, number or percentage of the collections for the entire Navy in that area. And it's, a, it's something that's been flagged as a, as a concern all the way up to headquarters. Um, but coming out in the new 5091D, there was a uh, recent new requirement for cultural resources to, to address and curate paleontological collections. That's now a, a, a new tasker for CR. Am I, I incorrect on that? Not quite. No, not quite. And I probably should have talked about that, but I, I'm afraid paleo is getting more airtime overall in the Navy these days than it really needs. The, no, it's not, it's not a mandate in the 5090 to uh, collect and, and manage uh, paleo. It's more a matter of uh, recognizing the fact that, that paleontological resources are, are a component of the Navy's responsibility as a federal landowner and cultural resources folks and natural resources folks are the logical members of the Navy community to be to help uh, address the character of the challenge. Uh, so no, it's not it not intended to be a requirement to start curating. It's more a matter of uh, 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 looking at areas of potential sensitivity. So one of the things in the 5090 uh, that's being drafted is that when you do an archaeological survey or a natural resources survey, that you that there a part of the consideration would would look at the geologic situation to see whether there are uh, uh, areas of probability. It shouldn't really go beyond that at this point, at least not the way I'm understanding the expectation. It's just to provide a sense of awareness so, so that if, you know, major grading or something is happening in an area uh, where, th where there's a recognized potential, that, that we're considering that in the process. Uh, we, there is, we are working on, I, I can't say more than the fact that we're working on it, we are working on the idea of trying to provide uh, some, some sort of headquarters project uh, that would provide a, I mean, for lack of a better term right now, I'll call it a paleo context document that would be available to everybody as, you know, a, a frame of reference so that you wouldn't be starting from zero on this. It, it's not meant to be a new management responsibility. It's meant to be to, to leverage the, the knowledge and the skill we have to, to find a way to increase awareness about this so that it doesn't become a problem. In yeah. the future. I think from my perspective it's an awareness issue to the to the point where I'm hoping that on areas where it has a risk of, of being an issue that the natural resources manager and the cultural resources manager have had you know have duked it out and they figured out who's <laughs> who's the first on scene um, and just kind of have identified a process for dealing with it because when they found the, the mammoth tooth on China Lake you know like everybody was like Bah! And so now we're kind of like, well, who owns it? And the natural resources people are pointing at the cultural resources people, and the cultural resources people are pointing at the natural resources people, and the natural resources people are putting arrowheads everywhere, so, you know, just in case. And, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but the, the issue is that, you know, we really don't know, we don't have a clearer idea of who owns it, and I think it, it just, we needed to find that better. So. All right. Thanks, thanks for the clarification. That kind of calms my nerves a little. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, thank you very much for your time. I'm sorry I went over a little bit. And if you have any questions, please feel free to come up. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>